For our final session today, I'm joined by two stellar experts on hypersonic capabilities. Dr. Kelly Stefani, Associate Professor in the Center for Hypersonics and Entry System Studies at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and Dr. Mark Lewis, Director of the National Defense Industrial Association's Emerging Technology Institute and former Director of Defense Research and Engineering for the Department of Defense. Long titles, that means you're both very important. Uh, Mark, I want to start with you. You wrote an op-ed in April stating there's, there's cause for optimism on hypersonics, but we are not yet on the path to success. Why not? And in the last six months since you wrote this, have you seen some promising signs or no? So thanks, thanks, thanks for having me on, and it's an honor to be on a panel with Professor Stefani. Um, so um, let me start off by saying, by any measure that I can construct, we have we had fallen behind Russia and especially China. And you know, as I've spoken many times, the China especially basically stole our homework. They 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 built on our success, built on our research, and now they've gone to deployed systems where we're still in the research and development phase. Russia, same thing. We see them uh, uh, deploying hypersonic systems. Early in the program, it was mentioned that the Russians are already using hypersonic systems in Ukraine, although not very effectively, which I would say says more about the ineffectiveness of their, their, their weapons and less about the capabilities of hypersonics. Um, we do see a significant acknowledgement of the importance of hypersonics across the board. I think we heard it from the, our members of Congress who joined us earlier. We see bilateral support for investments in hypersonics uh, the department continues to rank hypersonics as, as a top priority. So that's the reason that we're optimistic. If I look at the various services, we see each of the services has hypersonic programs, and they're, they all make sense in the context of those services. However, we still have some roadblocks. One is we have inadequate testing infrastructure. And again, early in the program, as mentioned, we're making investments there, but we're still not there. So we have a backlog in testing. That's both on the ground and also in flight tests. And also, of course, we're still having to, to, to litigate in some cases it, to explain to people why hypersonics is important. And you would think the case has already been made, it's already been demonstrated, it's been studied to death, and yet every once in a while we still have people coming up with the question of why would we want hypersonics. And then finally, there's still a lack of coordination. And we really need to approach hypersonics as a whole of government, whole of nation problem if we're going to deliver this capability to our warfighters. Kelly, same question to, to you. In, with our crack staff, you said the window is closing for investment on hypersonics. Why is that? Well, that's a great question. And to put this into context, um, what we think about from the university side or from academia is the time frame that we have to train workforce in this space. So if you think about you know, master's level, PhD level talent, we're looking at you know, uh, deploying these students if we can retain them uh, two years for master's and five years for PhD. Um, if you think about the time frame that other countries are operating and the readiness that they have today and where they are projecting to move in the next five, 10 years, um, we're, we're definitely needing to ramp up now, even yesterday, to, to train in this area. And I want to also footstomp something that was mentioned earlier from Representative Norcross is that it's not just the master's and PhD students that we need to be training, but we need to have tradespeople that can also instrument, that can you know manufacture, um, and this is a this is a, a challenging space to operate in. Um, so I think all of that needs to be taken into account when we're considering what window of opportunity we have and when we're we're looking at an opportunity that's that's gone by. Mark, I want to go back to you on follow up on what you said about Russia and how their use of hypersonics. Uh, has not been impressive. Did that surprise you? Because the war in general has surprised the world, where a lot of people thought Kiev would be falling within weeks, and then the Russian military has has underperformed to say, to say you know the least amount. I mean, a lot of people think that they're just shocked uh, about the the lack of readiness from the Russian military. So actually, no, it didn't surprise me. Um, you know, we've been hearing reports for years about Russian investments in hypersonics, and frankly, the Russians are building in many cases on a thirty-year-old Cold War legacy. Um, so I don't want to make light of their investments and the fact that they've deployed. But the country that actually worries me the most is China, because their systems uh, factor much, much more closely into what we would anticipate as future warfighting capabilities in that part of the world. And uh, we've seen some very, what appear to be very capable systems in the hands of the Chinese. And are they, uh, what, what has been the intel? Is it pretty, pretty good on the Chinese that they are pretty well advanced beyond uh, our capabilities? 
So let, let me just say that the intelligence community has done a phenomenal job of assessing the state of the art around the world. It, it's a, an incredible success story. We have pretty good knowledge. And the answer is very simple that the Chinese already have deployed. I mean, it, it, this is not a secret. They showed it off to us. In, in 2019, they did a military parade where they were happy to show off their existing hypersonic weapons. And you think about how the Chinese would use their weapons. It factors in exactly what their needs in, in, in their part of the world. They're developing uh, tactical systems that can hold our Navy at risk, tactical systems that can hold our air bases at risk. It makes sense in the context of what the Chinese hope to gain. Uh, Kelly, I've got a question uh, that was sent in from uh, audience member Joanna Ablaza of BAE Systems. And the question is this. Given the global supply chain disruptions, can the defense industry scale up production of these new hypersonic weapons? Yeah, that's a that's a really important challenge for us to be able to address. And I think what what we're doing is pivoting in a way that will allow us to manufacture at scale. So if you think about the raw resources that are required to manufacture a thermal protection system or required to make structural components for, for a hypersonic vehicle, we're now pressed with the challenge of finding ways that allow us to manufacture at scale. And that's going to require, again, um, you know, sort of reinventing um, our, our strategy, our approach, and how we actually manufacture at scale. Um, so one example, you know, is uh, looking at, you know, uh, resourcing for carbon fibers, for example. Uh, that's a, a common feature in TPS materials. And our reliance, honestly, has been on, you know, uh, overseas suppliers. So how do we pivot? How do we now bring everything back you know, to, to, um, the, to the U.S. for manufacturing. And that will, um, I, I think, you know, put us in a position where we're not so exposed, especially when trying to develop these systems um, when, when the, you know, when the geopolitical climate is shifting uh, quickly. Kelly, you mentioned that you're coming at this from, from academia. Uh, what do you think uh, of the future as far as getting talented people uh, into the defense industry, the Pentagon, uh, to protect the homeland, uh, that's going to be key over the next decade or two. Absolutely. Um, the, the way that we're approaching this is to, of course, you know, recruit talent early and often, and that's something that universities are are very good at doing. Um, but really the challenge is how do we address, you know, the alternative um, fields of study that students have to choose from? And there's a lot of options for them these days. Um, so the way that we approach this is to to partner with government, to partner with industry partners, and find ways to bring the best possible talent and to retain them. Um, so it's one thing to be able to train them and to you know um, move them through uh, degree completion, but we also need to keep them you know within this field and give them incentives to stay. Um, so that's something that we're doing through uh, with partnership with the Joint Hypersonic Transition Office um, and its university arm, which is the University Consortium for Applied Hypersonics. But I, I think we have to um, increase tenfold our investment in that space. Um, if you think about the number of PhDs and master's students that we're producing now, um, it's not sufficient to replace the retiring workforce. So if we're going to get serious about this, we need to have significant increase in investment for um, these university affiliated partnerships. Um, they need to be integrated directly with government partners and with industry partners so that our students are ready to transition upon graduation and become a, a major proponent uh, for force in this area. In this area. And on the education component, Kelly, do you see China ahead of us? Um, yes, the, the, the straight answer is yes. Um, if you look back, and this is what Mark was saying earlier, I agree 100%. Um, you know, we've, we've developed these technologies. We've basically done the homework for um, our adversaries. And they have now, you know, seen the strategic advantage of, of leveraging these capabilities for weapons. And that's what we're up against right now. Uh, and we know what we're up against. It's really a matter of getting the resources, um, developing the innovations, you know, within the universities, transitioning those quickly to uh, the warfighter, and again, having the resources to do so. So, uh, you know, we really challenge our our uh, congresspersons and uh, the nation in general to recognize this threat and to act on this. We have a limited time, and it's it's something that we have to you know rally on at this point. Mark, as far as the amount of weapons, uh, experts say, you know, having a few of these uh, hypersonics is, is not going to cut it. We've got to have a whole fleet uh, of, of hypersonics. Uh, what are the obstacles there and how quickly can we get a fleet of weapons? Correct. So, so that's absolutely right. I mean, building, you know, weapons and, you know, handfuls 
that's not going to that's not going to deter anyone. It doesn't give us a credible capability. We need to be thinking in terms of hundreds and thousands, as our competitors are. So um, the obstacles. First, um, you know, I think I think Secretary Shu talked about cost. We needed to get the cost of the of these systems down. But I want to emphasize, you know, there is a there is a notion that hypersonic weapons will automatically be really expensive. I disagree with that. I think there are certain applications, especially the air breathing cruise missiles that that John Otto talked about, that can be manufactured at a cost that's comparable to to existing capabilities today. So that's one obstacle. Second obstacle is, of course, is as you've already alluded to, supply chain. Uh, 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 the supply chain. Now, the supply chain that produces demonstrators, you know, one or two demonstrators a year is very different than the supply chain that can produce hundreds or thousands of weapons. And then third, something else that you've alluded to and that, that Professor, uh, Professor Stefani also alluded to, uh, and that is test facilities. Now, right now, we have a backlog in our test facilities. If you want to go do a hypersonic test, you could be facing months or even years waiting time to get into the wind tunnel. That is not a recipe for success, and that's not a way to deliver capability at large numbers quickly. So we need to get, we need to get that in, 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 in place. And, and again, the good news is both Congress and the Pentagon are taking that very seriously. And as a follow-up to that, Mark, as far as um, complementing, you know, there are a lot of different people think of the Pentagon, but there are many different agencies uh, within the Pentagon, missile defense. Uh, how is that coordination going within our own uh, defense department? So, um, you know, I, I think we've made tremendous progress. I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, both the Army and the Navy have their own hypersonic programs, but they are joined at the hip. They are sharing information, sharing technologies. It's, a, it's an incredible good news story. Um, uh, Kelly mentioned the Joint Hypersonic Transition Office. Um, that, was do that has been doing a phenomenal job of integrating also across the services. We have a principal director for hypersonics whose primary job is to work across the services. So we are making a lot of progress there. Even in the defensive side, you've got the Missile Defense Agency that was mentioned that's taking the lead in the hypersonic ballistic track and satellite system, the HBTSS, really important for defense. They're working hand in glove with the Space Development Agency to deploy a space sensor capability. So all in all, I think we, we've got a lot to be proud of. Still progress to be made, but, but we're certainly moving in the right direction. Kelly, I want to throw the, the cost question to you. Uh, do you think, do you agree with Mark that over time it's not going, you know, the critics say, well, we can't, we can't afford it, we've got, a, we've got a massive debt deficit, especially after COVID, but, but as technology improves, well, costs usually go down, right? I think that's that's very fair. Um, basically, the better that we get at building these systems and the more we understand them, the less iteration is required in our design cycle. Um, where we stand right now, um, you know, there are capabilities. Just as an example, um, University of Illinois has a, a, a inductively coupled plasma torch facility that allows us to, you know, test, you know, certain high temperature materials. If we want to move into components, there is, you know, some design iteration that's required in order to test these systems. The more we test, the better we get at testing, the better we get at diagnostics, the better we get at instrumentation and postmortem analysis, of course. So um, again, if we if we have these facilities in place and we train students on them and they enter the workforce with that knowledge, with that, you know, with that brain power, um, that's something that we can do to sort of short circuit this problem. So this is not this is a um, I'd say this is like a, a very transient problem. Um, that can be resolved, you know, quickly once we uh, ramp up in these capabilities. Mark, you, you worked on a lot of these issues at, at the Pentagon. What, is, what did that experience teach you? And obviously most of our audience has not worked at the Pentagon. What, what does the outside world need to know about uh, the inner workings of the Defense Department uh, in this area? So the Department of Defense can be very efficient when it steps up to the plate. And, and, you know, we think of it as, as a monolithic bureaucracy, but when it focuses, as, for example, we did with Operational Warp Speed, um, it can do amazing things. And I think that's what we're seeing right now in hypersonics. Um, the other thing I can, I can point to is you know, this is an issue. Hypersonics is a technology which has, frankly, bilateral support, support across the, the Pentagon. Um, I, I used to joke you, you couldn't walk 10 feet down the E-ring of the Pentagon without hearing someone say the word hypersonic. I think now it's you can't walk five feet down the Pentagon without hearing the word hypersonic. There's a general recognition of the importance of this technology. And frankly, it's come about because of analysis and studies that have been quite sober. One last thing if I could quick, quickly emphasize. The Pentagon, the Department of Defense knows it's, it, doesn't, it, it isn't just about countering Russia and China. This is a capability that the department needs regardless. Russia and China, especially China, are setting the timescale because of how quickly they're moving. But this really is a next 
uh, uh, tech capability that's important for, for our own warfighters, regardless of what any other country is doing. Uh, I want to ask a question uh, by Gabriel Schram of Morgan Franklin. Uh, and Kelly, why don't we go to you for this one? Uh, how will cybersecurity play a role in the development of these technologies? You know, Jay Powell, head of the Federal Reserve on 60 Minutes, said cybersecurity keeps him up at night. Does it keep you up at night? Well, that, that's one thing that keeps me up at night. Um, but I, I agree. I think cybersecurity is going to be, um, you know, one element of our ability to successfully uh, develop and also um, protect these investments that we make for hypersonic technologies. Um, and so, you know, as these weapon platforms become um, more capable and integrate uh, smarter technologies, um, cybersecurity is going to play a larger and larger role in how we think about these systems and how we defend, uh, you know, against these systems. And so I think that that's something that we're going to have to integrate, you know, maybe not in our first iteration of, of weapon technologies, but it's certainly something that's on the horizon, something that we're going to need to fold in to the mix. Mark, your views and any, any final thoughts on, on, this, on this issue? Well, I'll leave you with a final thought, which is every time we did war games in certain scenarios around the world, we found out that when the United States was facing an opponent that had developed hypersonic capabilities, if we didn't have that capability, we lost. It was as simple as that. So this is a capability that has to be a high priority if we're going to be successful in the future fight. Kelly, your final thoughts. Um, again, I, we need to rally the nation. I, I think we need to get um, Congress people on board to, to support, you know, uh, universities in this endeavor um, and our partnerships with the government industry. Um, there's a lot of opportunity here. We're building that connective tissue. But in order for us to really realize these capabilities, um, there needs to be a real serious um, uh, investment in this space. Well, you both uh, brought your expert opinion and know a lot about this and really appreciate uh, your input uh, on today's program. Thanks again to Dr. Stefani, as well as Dr. Lewis. Appreciate you being here. Thanks for having okay. us. Thanks. Well, that brings us to the end of our program. A big thank you to Raytheon Technologies for their support and to all of you attendees for joining this discussion. For those of you who may, may have missed any of the conversations, video from the event will be up on our website shortly, thehill.com. I'm Bob Cusack. Have a great day.